أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back brothers and sisters and we are in session number 22 of this uh, great book Kitab al-Tawheed by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab um, and last week as you know we did a revision for the test just a reminder for all of you to do the test the second test, the test is open and the link has been posted on the groups. So please access it and, and, and finish the test. I think it, it closes, if I remember right, on Yom Al Ahad. I don't remember right now, but I think it is on Sunday evening, I suppose. Wallahu alam, but or Monday, I suppose. I'm not sure really. But please get on with it, inshallah, and, and do that. Um, right? Barak Lafi. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, we stopped in chapter 15 uh, before the revision. So we are in chapter 15. Uh, just a quick recap of the first few ayat. Naam, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ayushirakuna ma la yakhluku shay'an wa hum yukhlakun. Wa la yastati'una lahum nasran wa la anfusuhum yansurun. So do they attribute as partners to Allah those who created nothing but the themselves were created? No help can they give them, nor can they help themselves. Surat Araf. And we said that this chapter, the Sheikh brings uh, ayat and, and ahadith uh, to prove that creation cannot be worshipped. Right? Creation cannot be worshipped. Any simple and easy. And uh, this uh, Surat Araf, and we mentioned earlier, is a very good uh, chapter especially in Dawa to the idol worshippers like the Hindus and so on. It contains a lot of um, ayat to, to show rational, using rational and logic to show them that, you know, what they're worshipping is, is creation. How can how can you worship, right? So we saw this ayat that what they're worshipping is themselves created. So it doesn't make sense to worship that. And we also saw this ayat from Surah Fatir. Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala merges the night into the day and the day into the night. Naam, wasakhara shamsa wal khamar and the and the sun and the moon are, are commanded to uh, swim in their orbits, to go around. And the point of this ayat and the Sheikh bringing in this that he, it, it, it is evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who does all of these things. The creation of the night and the day, the alternation of the same, the merging of the same into one another. Uh, the creation of the sun and the moon, now, uh, to prove his rububiyyah. So if he is subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone who does all of this, right? And, and as the ayat says, such is Allah, your Lord. Naam, to him belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. Ah, so he said, and, and see the amazing contrast here, right? The ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that he is the one who created the night and the day and the sun and the moon and commanded them to go around in their courses naam, for a term appointed because on the day of judgment they will be thrown into hellfire. Naam. And Allah says, This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who does this. And his is the kingdom, the mulk, the dominion. And then the contrast comes that those who, whom you invoke besides this, besides Allah, the, the idols and the prophets and the angels. Whomsoever the people, God, man, whatever. They don't even own a khitmir. That's a huge contrast from, a, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who owns, uh, who, who owns the heavens and the earth. They belong to him. And these people whom you worship, they don't even own a khitmir, the thin membrane over a date stone. Tamar, you know, inside the tamar, the date, we talked about this. But the, the beauty of the ayat is the huge contrast which Allah brings. I mean, there's no comparison of a khitmir between, of, of a khitmir with the sun and the moon, for example. So why are you worshipping people who cannot even, who don't even own that uh, membrane, thin membrane? Yani? And we saw the next ayat from the same chapter, uh, Father, uh, So if you invoke them, these people besides uh, Allah, they hear not your call. Huh? And if they were to hear, they would not be able to give you what you want. Because they don't own it in the first place. Right? And on the day of judgment, as Allah says in this ayat, they will disown you. There will be debates, there will be arguments, there will be blame games 
happening and people will uh, who are being worshipped says Allah they will disown you and then can inform you Ya Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like him who is all knower uh, of, of, of knowledge yeah so that was what we saw and uh, we said that you know the three requirements basic requirements for the one who deserves to be worshipped says Allah is that he must own something uh, whatever you're asking for right he must own it yeah and he should be able to hear your call he should be able to hear a call and must be able to respond to your call now so we talked about this so this is only allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these attributes uh, suit him as the virgil the best so we stopped there yeah uh, so we stopped here uh, before the revision class so we want to inshallah continue chapter 15 Again, for those who joined late, we are doing chapter 15, uh, which the Sheikh titled um, that object, uh, sorry, the creation. The creation cannot be an object of worship. The creation cannot be an object of worship. So the hadith which the Sheikh brings in this chapter <coughs> is, is a very, very interesting hadith because there is a background to the hadith. Now, uh, Rasulullah said, uh, and this is from Anas bin Malik radiallahu an. Kaifa yuflihu qawmun hadabu wajhu nabiyyuhum. So, uh, Anas bin Malik, before the hadith, he said on the day of Uhud. And when we, when we say the day of Uhud, we mean the battle of Uhud. We mean the battle of Uhud. Naam, which happened in the uh, third year after Hijrah. Third year after Hijrah, the Madinan period. A molar tooth of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa was broken by the enemies, by the Quraysh. And Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was wounded. He was wounded. Blood started pouring down his face. And he started to wipe his face. And he said, this is when he said, Kaifa yuflihu qawman khadabu wajahu, wajahu face, nabiyuhum. Nabiyuhum. So how can any people prosper if they soak the face of their prophet with blood? Nabiyuhum bid dammi wa huwa yada'uhum ilallah. When he's calling them to Allah. So Rasulullah Sallallahu See again this shows you. That Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a human being. He was a human being. Kul innama ana bashir mithlukum. Because there are uh, people who have deviated in Islam. Who exaggerate on the person of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like the Barayilwiz and so on. Now, But Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here. He had his tooth broken. He had his cheek cut and he was bleeding. And Aisha anha, and Ali ibn Talib, her husband, they had to take care of him. And Aisha would use uh, Hasir, you know Hasir, the, the, the straw mat. She would burn that uh, straw mat and try to clot, uh, put it on the, on the wound to clot, the, uh, to, to stop the blood flowing. Now, but because he was a human being, sallallahu alayhi wa he reacted. Because of these injuries to him, he reacted. And he said this hadith, how can any people prosper if they soak the face of their prophet with blood when he is calling them to Allah? When he's calling them to Allah. And we'll see the relevance of this to the, to the topic of the chapter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately, immediately revealed ayat in Surah Al-Imran. We will see this ayat again in detail a bit later. Not for you is the decision. And, and it continues. The, the ayat means that, uh, Ya Muhammad, it is not for you to decide. Who is prospering, who is not prospering. And again, Islam defines prospering yeah, as someone who you know, becomes Muslim, who enters Jannah. That is what is meant by prospering in Islam. So Allah revealed an ayat, kind of admonishing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa saying that it is not for you to decide whom Allah turns in repentance to and whom he doesn't. Again, shows you the huge difference, uh, the disparity between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Rasulullah Sallallahu was a human being like you and me. The only difference is he was chosen by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, Al Mustafa, Al Mustafa, the chosen one. He was chosen by Allah huh, to bring his revelation to us. That's it. That's it. Also, when he died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? One of the last few words he said: "Do not exaggerate uh, my, upon me or on my person." as the Yahud and the Nasr have exaggerated on their prophets. And they built all their buildings and the tombs on them and all that stuff. And call me as Abd and uh, Nabi, the slave of Allah and the messenger of Allah. That's it. 
So, how is this Hadith relevant? Relevant, sorry, to Tawheed, to the matter we're discussing now. Uh, it talks about Ohud. Anas bin Malik refers to this in situation or this incident, which happened on uh, the day of Ohud. Ohud is basically a mountain uh, north of Medina. It's kind of a tourist destination. People go there and they visit it and, and they see where the battle was fought and so on. Because one of the major battles of Islam uh, was fought in, in Ohud. Yeah, and, and the plains of Ohud. Now, and uh, we're not getting into the battle, but long story short is that the battle initially was in, in, uh, going in favor of the Muslims. And Rasulullah sallallahu had appointed uh, Abdullah bin Jubair radiallahu an with an army or with a contingent, contingent or a small force of 50 archers on the mountain of Ohud. Because the Muslims were fighting with their back to the mountain. So the Ohud was on the rear and Quraysh were in the front of them. So he told Abdullah bin Jubair and, and his men uh, very clear instructions. He said, do not come down and, and take care of this position, this post, man the post. Do not come down until I tell you, even if you see vultures eating from our flesh, don't come down. So you, you're protecting us from the rear. But as, as the Muslims are winning, the Quraysh started leaving, fleeing away, leaving behind the booty, their, their weapons, their uh, camels, horses, whatever. And the Muslims started picking it up. Right? So the archers, when they saw this, they said, Khalas, the battle is finished. Let's go and, and take our share of the booty. Abdullah bin Jubair, he said, no, Rasulullah gave very explicit instructions to stay where we are. We should not move. But 40 out of the 50 disobeyed Abdullah bin Jubair. They went down using their own logic, as we all do. Myself first. We all use our logic, especially when it comes to the sunnah. Oh, this hadith doesn't make sense. Oh, this hadith is not for this day and age. Oh, this hadith is, you know, for that period. Today, things have changed. We should change Islam. We should customize Islam. We should modernize Islam. We, we, see, we see all of this, including scholars of today, so-called scholars of today. We see what happens when we disobey Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these 40 came down. Khalid bin Walid, who was at that point still a kafir, because he became Muslim later in Fatah Makkah, he was also fleeing and he saw this vantage, he saw this opening there at the mountain, only 10 archers. And he took an army of his men, a small force, went up the mountain, he attacked these archers and killed all of them. All of them died, Shaheed. And then he came down the mountain, attacking the Muslims from the rear. So the Quraysh are fleeing, the Muslims are going behind them, chasing them away from the battlefield. And suddenly now, at the back, they see Khalid and Walid and his men attacking the Muslims. And when this started, there was a commotion. There was noise and there was a disturbance. So the Quraysh were fleeing. They turned around to see what's happening. And they saw the Muslims busy with Khalid and Walid. So they came back to attack the Muslims from the front. So now the Muslim army was sandwiched between the Quraysh coming back, returning, and Khalid and Walid from the other side of the mountain of Ahud. And that's when things changed. And what was a sure victory turned into a defeat. All because of why, brothers and sisters? Why? Something which we do every day, every day, wallahi, every day we're disobeying Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know the hadith, we know it is sahih, but we try to find excuses. Subhanallah. But those Muslims who disobeyed Abdullah bin Jubair and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah mentions in the Quran. But you and me, huh, we don't have any guarantee of this. There's no guarantee. So we talked about this hadith and, and we said that yeah, the prophets are human, all of them, not only Rasulullah, all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were human beings and subject to injury. They, they used the hammam, they married, they had children. Normal human beings. Because the Jews, for example, they exaggerate on the person of Uzair and they say he's the son of God. The Nasara, they say Isa is the son of God. And all this is shirk, of course. Today you have the people like Bareblis, maybe other deviant groups as well, who exaggerate on the person of Rasulullah. Now, and in fact, some of the things they say are so, yani, I can't even say it. If we don't know it, it's better. Alhamdulillah. Time. So all these issues are there. 
and, and the hadith is trying to say that this is a human being. You do not worship creation. He is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was born to a mother. He had a mother, he had a father. Naam, he had, uh, he was breastfed. Naam, he, he lived a life as any other human being. So do not worship him. That's the point of the hadith. That they, because how can you worship someone whose tooth is broken, whose cheek can get cut, and he can bleed? And if you say he is Allah, because Bareilly sometimes claim that, and if you say he has ilm al-ghayb, huh? if Rasulullah had ilm al-ghayb, knowledge of the unseen, he would never get into the battle of Uhud. Because he knows, he knows he's, going to, he's going to suffer. He's going to have harm. He knows he, it, it, may be, it may be a defeat for the Muslims. So he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even, sorry, get into the battle of Uhud. This also shows, shows you that Rasulullah does not have ilm al-ghayb. Except that which Allah has revealed to him. That's it. And which in turn was revealed to us or informed to us, sorry. And the prophets of Allah cannot do anything, even though Rasulullah has said in this case that how can you prosper? How can these people prosper when they heard their prophet? Huh? This cannot happen except of Allah wills. Shows you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is way above his creation. And hence worthy of worship. It also shows you that Rasulullah says to himself and the other prophets, they do not know the future. They don't know the destiny of people unless what has been revealed to them. Like this, in this case, as we will see, I think the next hadith talks about it, so I'll kind of skip for that. And no one knows what a person's last actions will be except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khalid bin Walid is a striking example. Khalid bin Walid in this battle in Uhud, he was on the side of the Quraysh, the Kuffar, attacking and killing the Muslims. But in Fatah Makkah, in the eighth year after Hijrah, sorry, the ninth year after Hijrah, he became Muslim. Before Fatah Makkah, he becomes Muslim. And he becomes a fantastic Muslim. In fact, if you read the Seerah of, Seerah of Khalid bin Walid, his biography, you will see that Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an, was such a fantastic commander and military general that he never lost a battle, either in Islam or even before in Jahiliyyah. He never lost a battle. This Khalid and Walid. So the people who, who attacked and killed the archers, Allah guided his heart. Allah softened his heart to Islam. Allah opened up his heart to Islam. Which shows you again, brothers and sisters, that guidance, Hidayat Tawfiq, Hidayat Tawfiq is only in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody else. If you, if you think somebody else is making people Muslim or bringing them into Islam because of their efforts, this is a, a thought of shirk or a statement of shirk. That's another Tawheed lesson from this hadith. <clears throat> and it shows you also that turning to Allah and sincere repentance because some of these people became Muslim, as you will see, inshallah. And the Muslim is forbidden to despair of Allah's mercy no matter how many sins he commits. This rule does not apply to shirk. And this happens, actually. In fact, only yesterday somebody was telling me, I was visiting some relatives, and they were telling me that, you know, there are people who, for example, Muslims, who think that, okay, I'm, I'm doing this sin and I'm doing that sin and I'm doing this and that. Uh, uh, with what face or how can I stand and pray in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So they don't, they don't pray. You see how shaitan comes to, comes to somebody? So he puts the thought in their minds that you're committing so many sins. Uh, you're doing this and that and I don't know, riba and maybe... Khamar and I don't know, Allah, Allah, whatever sin it may be, lying, cheating in business. So with what face and how dare you stand in front of Allah? That's how shaitan puts the waswasa. So now this guy doesn't even pray. When in fact, prayer is the only solution for him. That is the only escape. That is the only salvation for him. Huh? So, no matter what sins a person commits, the doors of Allah's mercy are always open. Except if one dies on shirk. I should have rephrased that sentence. If one dies on shirk, khalas, it's closed. He's, he's, he's doomed to hell forever. We, we saw about, talked about this in the, in the first few five chapters. Yeah, But even shirk, if he repents before dying sincerely, 
inshallah, inshallah Allah will accept his repentance. As we saw with the Muslims of, of uh, the companions, the Sahaba, ma'am, most of all, rather all of them were kuffar at one point. They were, kuffar, they were kafir. But when Allah guides them, khalas, alhamdulillah, they became the best of Muslims. So repentance is what matters. The second hadith is a kind of continuation of the same incident reported also from uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, and we say anhuma because uh, the duality, yeah? Why do we say that? Who knows? Yeah. Why do we say uh, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma? The Khaja, Naam. Uh, because uh, both his son and father both are uh, Rizwan Allah is going. That's why uh, his father is Umar al Khattab. His father is Umar al Khattab, radiallahu anhu. And we mentioned this many times. So whenever, uh, yes, now father and son both are uh, Sahabi, both are from the companions of Rasulullah. So when we say, when we talk about the son, Abdullah, we say, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with both of them. Even though we're talking only to, we're referring only to Abdullah. But because Abdullah is Abdullah because of his tarbiyah. His, his, his upbringing, by Umar bin Khattab, who's also a Sahabi. Naam? That's why we say this. Naam. Okay. <clears throat> okay. What's this? Please continue. The How was the end of Khalid and Walid? How was the end of... What do you mean, end of Khalid and Walid? How he died or... I didn't understand the question. Or are you referring to the Battle of Uhud? Kindly, kindly uh, re, uh, repost it. Jazakallah khair. Right. So, this hadith uh, he heard the Messenger of Allah وسلم, say when he raised his head from bowing in the last rakat of the Fajr prayer. So Rasulullah he was praying Salatul Fajr, Masjid Nabawi. Naam. And uh, when he raised his head from bowing after Sajda in the last rakat, he said, Oh Allah, curse, curse, sorry, curse, fala and fala and fala. And then Allah revealed, Not for you is the decision. The same ayat in Surah Al-Nabran. So there are two riwayat and both are sahih. Allahu alam. Naam. But in this case, uh, in another narration, sorry, Rasulullah Sallallahu invoked or supplicated to Allah against three uh, people from Quraysh. Safar bin Umayyah, Suhaib bin Amr, and Al-Harith bin Hashim. Hisham, sorry. And then this verse was revealed. So this is the hadith. And the Ravi of this hadith, when we talked about him, Abdullah bin Omar, uh, he was a pious Sahabi and a very fantastic scholar. Many of You'll find many of his hadith in, in the books of hadith. Naam, and he died uh, at a very, uh, after a long time after the death of Rasulullah, uh, 73 Hijri. The ayat which is referred to this hadith and in the previous hadith, that not for you is the decision, Surah Al-Imran. Naam. Laisa laka minal amri. Not for you is the decision. Naam. Shayun aw yatuba alayhim aw yu'adzibihum fa innahum zalimun. So Allah says in Surah Al Imran, Ayat 128, not for you, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the decision whether he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turns in mercy or punishes them. Verily, they are zalim. So it's not up to you to say, Fala, how will he prosper? How will he? And this is a very good lesson for people like us who are, you know, like, what do you say, trigger happy. Huh? We, got, we got our finger on the trigger of takfir. Huh? You know what is takfir? Takfir is calling someone a, a kafir. So you and me, we are not supposed to, we are not allowed, we, it's, it's haram for us to call someone, a falam person, X, Y, Z, as a kafir. I'm talking about Muslims, of course. Non-Muslims, we are supposed to call them kafirs. And if you don't do, we have a problem in our iman. But Muslims, people who look like, appear as Muslims, we are, we, are, we are prohibited from calling them kafirs. It's not for us. Huh? <clears throat> because you never know how he will die. Maybe he's doing actions of kufr. This is what you can say. You can say he's falling into kufr or he's doing actions of kufr, but you cannot say he is a kafir. This is not allowed. Absolutely. It's reserved for the scholars after they advise them and, and sit with them and discuss the matter with them. Now, So this diet was referred in both the ahadith we saw. Yeah, about uh, the situation in Ahud. Let's say uh, that it is not for uh, you, your Rasulullah's decision uh, about whom Allah turns to in mercy 
and whom he punishes, it is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his supreme wisdom. And when we say a curse, because the hadith is talking about a curse, let's come back in. Abdullah bin Umar anhuma, he heard Rasulullah cursing certain people. Safar bin Umayyah, Suhail bin Amr, and Al Harith bin Hisham. He cursed them. The Messenger of Mercy cursed them. Naam, Taib. So, curse is what? What is a curse? How do you define this in Islam? It's a dua, it's a supplication uh, to deprive someone or something of Allah's mercy. And so it reminds me of something. In battles, in, in, in Rasulullah in his battles, which he fought, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever he would say, not during the battle, but maybe before it or after it, yeah, uh, maybe before it, more normally, we have some hadith on this, that he would say, Oh Allah, have mercy on Falan, Falan person. So the Sahaba automatically would understand that this person is going to become a Shaheed now. It happened once, uh, I forget the name of the Sahabi. Uh, he was very good in, in, in uh, Nasheed, Nasheed regarding battles and bravery and valor uh, to, to, to urge the people to fight, the Muslims to fight. And he would recite this and, and he had a very good voice. His even Kirat was very good. And Rasulullah said, Oh Allah, have mercy on this person. So Sahaba went to Rasulullah and said, Yeah, Rasulullah, yeah, yani, what did you do? We, we were enjoying his, his Kirat and we liked him so much. So they automatically knew that this meant he's headed for Jannah. That this is this the, the, the mercy of Allah on this person means khalas, inshallah, he will die a shaheed because it's a battle situation and he is headed for Jannah. So the curse is something of the opposite. Headed for hellfire. We talked about Uhud and how difficult the situation was for Rasulullah because when, when the army was sandwiched between the, the retreating uh, or the, uh, the returning, returning to Quraysh and uh, the contingent of the force of Khalid and Walid. From the rear, uh, this is when Rasulullah was, was, was completely surrounded. Rasulullah was completely surrounded by the Quraysh. And he had, sorry, he had with him Abu Bakr Siddiq, excuse me. He had with him Abu Bakr Siddiq, he had with him um, Sahib Nabi Waqas, Naam, who were protecting him and, 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 and trying to ward off. The, the, the spears and the arrows and the, the blows. They would wrap their bodies around Rasulullah to, to take the blows on their own bodies. And in spite of that, Rasulullah's tooth was broken and his cheek, cheek was cut and he was bleeding. So it was a very difficult situation for Rasulullah in the Battle of Uhud. And these three people, Safa bin Uwaiya and uh, Suhail bin Amr and Harib bin Isham, they became Muslim later on. They made tawbah to Allah. Allah accepted their tawbah and he guided them into Islam. So Herb bin Amr was one of the people who came to negotiate with Rasulullah in Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. He was one of the person who negotiated. He was the one with whom the, the treaty was finally uh, documented and signed off. So Herb bin Amr, he came from the Quraysh. He was such a person that when, when, when Ali bin Abi Talib was writing the treaty, Rasulullah told Ali, Ali bin Abi Talib, sorry, so Rasulullah could not write. He said, write Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So he stopped him and he said, write only Bismillah. We don't know ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So the Quraysh didn't believe in ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So Rasulullah said, okay, erase it, write Bismillah. And then he said in the name, write in the name of, uh, sorry, this is a treaty agreed upon between Muhammad uh, Rasulullah and uh, Suhail from Quraysh. So he stopped him again. He said, no. Right, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, your name and your father's name. Because if we believe you are Rasulullah, you would never be negotiating in the first place. Such a person, Suhail bin Amr, such a person. Such a person. Such a, a strong uh, Shadid Kafir. And a year, year later, one year later, in the eighth year of Hijrah, he becomes Muslim. And he is the one who brings the camels to Rasulullah for slaughtering them. After his Umrah. Allahu Akbar. So you see, Hidayat Tawfiqi is only in the hands of, in, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of these people became Muslim. This is what is meant by the ayat that it is not for you uh, who Allah turns in mercy. But the, the point we're trying to get in, in terms of Tawheed is also the fact that 
Rasulullah was a human being. He did not know Ilm al-Ghayb except what was revealed to him. And he was hurt, he was harmed, he was injured. So how can anybody worship him? Also another example, Abu Talib. Abu Talib, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa whom Rasulullah loved so much because he took care of him after the death of his, you know, his father, of course, died before, but his grandfather. After that, Abu Talib took care of him. Right into, the, into his mid-years. Mid year, mid and when he was dying, Rasulullah was there by his bedside saying, Oh, uncle, say the shahada, say la ilaha illallah. In fact, he told him, whisper in my ear and I will use this to fight with Allah or, or fight for you or try to get shifa for you on the day of judgment. But there was also Abu Jahl standing there and saying, how can you die on the religion other than the religion of Abdul Muttalib? And eventually Abu Talib, the one who Rasulullah loved so much, so much. If Rasulullah had the power, authority, Audhu Billah, to guide anyone to Islam, it would have been Abu Talib. Abu Talib died with his last word saying, I am dying on the deen of Abdul Muttalib, shirk. So you see, if Rasulullah himself could not guide his uncle, how can you and I do this? All we do is show the path, show the way. As we saw in the, the, the chapter on Dawah, we talked about this earlier as well. Making Dawah to La ilaha illallah, right? We talked about this. Time. And we see people going to the grave of Rasulullah today in Masjid Nabawi, turning towards the grave, raising their hands and saying, Ya Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah, Ya this, give me this, give me this, trying to touch the grave and wipe it on their bodies, the, the iron grill or whatever. All this is haram. All these are acts of shirk. Nah? So even, even any graveyard, and this is a good point to mention here, any graveyard you go to, let's say your relative has passed away and buried in a particular graveyard and you go there to make dua for the person. Nah? How do you make dua? You turn towards the qibla, raise your hands and you make dua. You don't face the grave. Many times we see brothers facing the grave, raising their hands and making dua, and the qibla is behind them. This is wrong. This is a major error. You turn towards the qibla. That is the etiquette of dua. The grave could be behind you. It's okay. No problem. You can also make the dua for that person from your home. You don't even have to go to the grave. But you face the qibla. That's important. And we said Rasulullah does not know al-ghayb except what was revealed to him. Example, uh, Ashar Mubashar, the 10 given the glad tidings of Jannah. Rasulullah in his lifetime, uh, it was revealed to him that 10 from his Sahaba, Rabbi Allah an, would enter Jannah. 10 people. This is, this is one hadith. With their other hadith talking about other Sahaba also entering Jannah based on revelation. Now, entering Jannah is something in the future. Ilm al ghaib knowledge of the unseen. Nobody knows this. Type. Ya Ustad, then how come Rasulullah knew this? How can you say he does not know Al-Ghayb? This was revealed to him. That's how he knows it. That's it. Beyond that, he does not know anything else of the Ghayb. Because then, the major mistake what we are doing, the serious act of major shirk which we are doing is equating Rasulullah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you say it is only Allah who knows in Al-Ghayb, and then you also claim Rasulullah knows Ilm al Ghaib and he is uh, this and that and Hazir, Nazir and everywhere, present everywhere. What are you doing now? You're now equating Rasulullah and bring his, raising his level to the level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is shirk. Shirk al Akbar. Naam. Sorry. Rasulullah invoked or made a curse against these people from Quraysh in Salat al-Fajr. Salat al-Fajr. Scholars say it is based on this evidence. It is permissible to invoke Allah in Salah to have his wrath befall the mushrikun. As you see in Taraweh, for example, in many places, uh, the imams making dua in dua kunut, let's say, for example, against the Yahud to free Palestine and so on and so forth, for example, yeah, it's common. That's permissible based on this evidence. This is the evidence. Kunut, ma'am. You can do this in Kunut. Naming a person in the dua does not nullify the dua. Because here Rasulullah, he specifically, explicitly named 
سفان بن امية سويب العمر and Harid bin Hisham he named them by name by name so doing this in salah or in your dua will not nullify your dua and it is impermissible to make dua to the awliya Allah which in this case is an example of this ahadith example we are talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the hadith also the, actually the Arabic text mentions more in detail from uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu that Rasulullah did the tasmi and tahmeel in salah so when he was getting up from sujood going into sujood so this is also evidence of the imam saying sami allahu liman hamida tasmi and the imam saying rabbana wa laqal hamd which is tahmeel so the scholars also derived that this is Allah, this is this is required from the imam this of the wajibat the the obligations of salah to mention the tasmi and the tahmeel in salah and mention it, the arabic text of the hadith talks about this as well Taib. again a fantastic hadith on the same topic what is the topic? Chapter 15, that creation cannot be an object of worship. Again, creation can never be an object of worship. Period. Abu Huraira radiallahu an, he said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood up when it was revealed to him. That this ayat was revealed to him and warned your tribe of mere kindred. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O oh, people of Quraysh, or words like that, Sell your own souls. Sell your own souls. I will not be of any help to you before Allah. And then to drive across the point even firmer, even, even stronger. Oh, Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib. Who's Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib? Huh? Who knows? Who's Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib? Radiallahu anhu. Hang on, let me give uncle. Okay, uh, who's the uncle? Is Abbas the uncle or Abdul Muttalib is the uncle? Because he's Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib. Abbas, Nam, Nam. Taib, Jazakallah khair. So Abbas, Abdul Muttalib was the grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib was the uncle. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is now addressing his own uncle. First he says, generally, ya yeah, people of Quraysh. Sell your own souls. I will not be of any help to you before Allah. Even though I'm part of Quraysh, I cannot help you before Allah. And then to drive across the point, because, you know, this is a common issue these days in the Muslim Muslims. He says, O oh, Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, I will not be of any help to you before Allah. O oh, Safiya, aunt of Allah's messenger, I will not be of any help to you before Allah. O oh, Fatima, the bint Muhammad, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ask of my wealth whatever you wish. I will be of no avail to you before Allah. Amazing hadith. Because today, Muslims, uh, see, this is the point we're trying to make many times, right? Our deen, our, our, our religion, or deen, rather, deen is a way of life. It covers everything. But you have Muslims today who make, what do you call it, uh, wasta or sifarish or shifa. They try to intercede for other people. Maybe sometimes these people are not deserving of that. Maybe in, in the situation of a job or situation of, um, uh, I don't know, wealth, uh, mar property matters, uh, interceding with someone. And the same situation is here. The Rasulullah is telling uh, that even he cannot help his own uncle, his own aunt, and his own daughter. That is why we need to train and, and do the correct tarbiyah of our children, of our families. Because on the day of judgment, on Yom Al-Qiyamah, in front of Allah, it is nafsi, nafsi. Myself, myself. Your own father, your own mother, your own son, your own daughter, your own wife, your own husband will run away from you. Your wife will be willing to throw you into hellfire to ransom herself and vice versa. And these are the people today for whom we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We openly, brazenly disobey Allah for the same relatives, wife, husband, children. 
we eat riba, we, 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 we spend in haram. So the wife is happy, the children are happy. We get them, uh, I don't know, iPads, tabs, so that they, they can download haram stuff, give them fast internet, so they can watch it very easily. The same people on the day of judgment, they will disown you. What matters? Amal. Your deeds. And in, for, to Fatima, Rasulullah in this hadith, he says, ask of me any wealth that you wish. Because I will be of no avail to you before Allah. In another hadith, which I remember just now, alhamdulillah, regarding Fatima, Rasulullah told, tells Fatima, Ya Fatima, and Fatima was a daughter. Rasulullah had four daughters. And Fatima was the one whom he loved very much. He loved her very much. And, 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 and if fathers are listening, I mean, it's normal that fathers like daughters more usually. Usually, not always the case. Now, so he loved Fatima very much. And he said, oh, Fatima, even if you were to steal, I will not be able to help you on the day of judgment. Your hands have to be cut off. His own daughter, his own daughter. But today we try to, you know, mini, mini, try excuses. Okay, I know this judge, I know this lawyer, I can get you out. No issues, go ahead, do whatever you wish. Muslims, Muslims do this. So, the, again, the point of the hadith with respect to Kitab at in this chapter is that the, person, the people who worship Rasulullah, let it be known to them that he cannot be of any help to them. Because he can't be of any help to his own blood relatives. What about you and I who are like 1400 generations away? Sorry, 400 years away, not generations. Yeah. Right? Barakallahu Fiqh? Nah. The Ravi of this hadith is Abdurrahman ibn Sakhar al Dawsi. And he was one of the greatest scholars of the Sahaba. He became a Muslim very late and narrated more than 5,000 ahadith. He died, depending on the historians, there's a difference of opinion, either 57, 58, or 59 Hijri. The Prophet Islam rose, in this case, let me, sorry, let me just go back to the hadith. Uh, the, 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 the Arabic text, in the English text, it says um, that Abu Huraira said that Allah's messenger stood up when it was revealed to him. But the Arabic text says he rose onto Mount Safa. So that's why that's mentioned there. He climbed up the hill of As Safa. You know As Safa? As Safa and Marwa, where you make your sai for Umrah and, and, and Hajj and so on. As Safa. And the hadith says, save yourself by selling your souls. So is soul a commodity? That's the question, right? So because we sell cars, we sell houses, we sell, I don't know, jewelry, bikes, whatever, furniture. Huh? But here Rasulullah is saying, sell your soul. In exchange for what, brothers and sisters? In exchange for Jannah. So saving or selling your soul means reaching a stage of Iman where you're saved from hellfire and you're, you're, there is salvation for you. And all this is through obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sincere faith and righteous deeds. We, we are not like the Christians. You know the Christians? They go to the church once in a while, one, one, once every Sunday. And what do they say? Oh, Father, I have sinned. So, you know, purify my sins and help me and save me. And that guy sitting inside, that priest or whatever, go, my son, you're forgiven. Subhanallah. Easy. Fast food. Yeah, it's easy. But for us, no. Jannah is hard work. And this is, the, this is the truth. You have to work hard. You can't go to any peer, any, any baba, any fakir, any uh, imam, any alim and tell, you know, please take my sins onto your head. It doesn't work that way. Naam? So salvation is to sincere faith and righteous deeds. One's ancestry cannot save him from hell. Common problem today. I'm a Chaudhri, I'm a Fala, I'm a Sheikh, I'm a Sayyid. I, my, 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 my name goes back all the way to Rasulullah Sallallahu So I'm, I'm good to go. I'm entering Jannah. Yalla, I can see the gates from here. Subhanallah. Mushkila. When Rasulullah Sallallahu cannot save his own relatives, Fatima, the daughter whom he loved so much, how can you, how can you fall uh, prey or fall trap to these I don't know what to call them. People who say, you know, you become a murid and I'm going to take you to Jannah. I will hold your hand into Jannah. I will come into the grave when the questions are asked. 
I will help you with the answers. I'll come on the day of judgment and help you. All nonsense, all kinds of nonsense. And this guy is not even related to you. The people have this, Muslims have this. This, this, this and the, what does it what does it turn into? How does it manifest? Huh? Kibr, kibr, fakr, kibr, arrogance. Oh, I am a Sayyid. I am Fala. I am a descendant of, I don't know. I am from Banu Hashim. I am the descendant of Imam Malik. I am uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm uh, what do you call them? Um, I'm, I'm uh, Abu Hanifa's disciple. People who think, and they have this, they have this, well, really, they think if you're a, if you're a Hanafi, if you're a Hanafi, khalas, your Islam is perfect and you're going to Jannah. Because most of the people around the world today are Hanafis. So it can't be wrong. Subhanallah. If that is the gauge, if aksariyat, if, if strength, if adad is, is, is the unit of measurement for entering Jannah, Christians will enter Jannah. Christians are more than us. But Allah says in the Quran the opposite. The aksariyat, he mentions the word aksariyat is in hellfire. Allah says the aksariyat is in hellfire. I'm not saying Hanafi is in hellfire. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, don't misquote me there. But what I'm trying to say is these people have this notion. I'm a Chaudhary, I'm a Fala. I'm a, in Pakistan, they say, I'm a Chaudhary. If I'm a Chaudhary, khalas. I'm good to go. Mushkila. Which also means that you cannot ask the Prophet to help you enter Jannah in this life. Because we're going to talk, we're going to talk about intercession, which is going to come in the next chapter. Or the next to next chapter, I don't remember. Yeah, the next next after after the after the next chapter, it'll be clearer to you then that you know what we mean by as shifa and, and shifa al akbar and can Rasulullah intercede and so on. We'll discuss that then. But for now, because Rasulullah himself is claiming in this hadith sahih that he cannot help his own daughter and his uncle and aunt, what point does it make to ask of him? Why? What does it? What sense does it make to worship him and to call upon him when he cannot? He is saying he cannot do this for you. And we talked about this earlier as well. The same thing is repeated that it's prohibited to ask something from someone as a creation, which only Allah can do and Allah controls and only Allah can owns and only Allah can give. And recall what we talked about, cap, capable, alive, present, now. Also, this hadith is evidence, uh, not only for asking Rasulullah, but you can do qiyas and you can map it to people who worship uh, righteous people, God men, they worship graves, they worship, they call upon the dead in the grave, they, they worship angels, and so on and so forth. The same thing applies. The Prophet in this hadith, in terms of the emphasis which he laid and how he stressed upon these points, picking his own relatives by name, uh, shows you his keenness to convey the message of Allah, the revelation to the people. And the people who are most deserving of the Prophet's intercession, because there is an intercession for the Prophet. We'll talk about it in chapter 17. There is an intercession. But I want to keep it till then. I don't want to bring it up now. A shifa. The people most deserving of that is not related to him. Not relatives, no. Not uh, lineage going back all the way up to, not a Sayyid, no. But people who obey him and follow him in what he commanded us to. An example of Abu Talib again. That being a relative is of no help. The Abu Talib's amal, the amals, with the, with the deeds of a person of helper. So Abu Talib could not be helped by his own nephew, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the scholars say he addressed his family members in this hadith, the scholars of hadith, name by name, one at a time, because he could have said, "Oh, relatives," for example. He, named, he mentioned them one by one uh, uh, by name so that they should not become proud and depend on the relationship to him. Well, I'm his daughter, I'm his uncle, I'm his aunt. Yeah. Also, the fact that the Quran was revealed because the Hadith talks about revelation, that I had been revealed on Mount Safa. It also shows you the permissibility, sorry, of asking Rasulullah for something which he can give while he was alive, because they would do this, the Sahaba. 
they would once Rasulullah Sallallahu was in Masjid Nabawi, he was uh, on the member. A Bedouin came in. When we say Bedouin, Badu, someone from the desert, yeah. And he was this guy was a farmer. He came in and he said, "Oh Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, make dua to Allah." You know, you have Rasulullah in front of you, alive in flesh. So it, it makes more sense to ask him to ask Allah than your own dua. Nah? So he said, oh, oh, Ya Rasulullah, make dua to Allah because our crops are dying. There's no rain. They're dying. Rasulullah, the hadith, the rabbi, the, the, the narrator of the hadith says, Rasulullah raised his hands towards the heavens, beseeching Allah, making dua. And he said, his hands did not come down, but the whole sky was overcast. Immediately. Allah sent clouds of rain over the area. And it started pouring, pouring. And then the Ravi says, the same Badu came, comes back a bit later and says, Ya Rasulullah, make dua to Allah to stop the rain. Because all the crops are dying. There's too much of rain now. Yeah. That's why we have the dua in, in, of, of, of Rasulullah, right? When, when it rains, what is the dua? Allahumma sahib al Oh Allah, make this a beneficial rain for us. Because the rain, anything from the sky, it can be beneficial. Or it can be detrimental, like for the people of Nuh alayhi who were flooded and destroyed, or Fir'aun for that matter. Now, so it's, it was permissible to ask Rasulullah, but when he was alive, not today, because today Rasulullah is dead. He is dead from this life, alive in this Barzakh life, as anybody else, as your great 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 grandfather is alive in the Barzakh life. So there's no difference. But from this dunya, he's dead. And even this, the Barilis don't like. They say we are Kustak and we say we, 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 we are cursing the Surah al and so on and so forth. Naam? So today you don't ask of him because he's no longer around you. Because you, if he's alive, Naam? To, to counter what the Baril will say, what did the Sahaba do by, uh, by digging a grave in the room of Aisha and lowering his body? Why did they bury a alive person? Doesn't make sense, right? Naam? So anyway, so when he's alive, yes, he could, he could be asked. And we prove our love for the Prophet ﷺ by following him again. That's the point we want to reiterate. Taib, okay. Okay, let's start this chapter and maybe stop midway, inshallah. Uh, chapter 16, okay, before that, any questions? How he dies, Khalid bin Walid. Okay, Khalid bin Walid, he, he became Muslim before Fatah Makkah, before Fatah Makkah. And uh, he, he rode down along with two of his companions who also became Muslim, entered Medina, and Rasulullah was overjoyed to see him because now he's a Muslim. And the way he died was on his deathbed. So he died a normal death. Even though Khalid bin Walid was someone who would jump into the battlefield. He was fearless. He was a legend. And yet, he couldn't die in the battlefield. He wouldn't get the state of the shuhada or the shaheed. He died on, on, on his deathbed. And he said a very famous statement which comes to mind. When he was dying, Khalid bin Walid, he said, May Allah curse the people, of, uh, referring to the cowards. Because people, you know, they think, okay, if you don't go, go into the battle, you're safe, you'll be alive. But here you have a person who jumped into, in the, in the, into the middle of every battle, every battle which he fought. He was in the front. Yet he is dying a natural death on his death, on his bed. So he said, May Allah curse such cowards. May Allah curse, I don't, I don't remember the exact words of the hadith, but something regarding their eyes and they do not see sleep. And he said that I, I, I wanted to die as a shaheed. But this is what Allah had distant for me. Qadr of Allah. Now, Barakallah. Uh, Brother Khaja, you have a question? Already covered. Barakallah. Yeah. The, the original name of Abu Huraira is Abdurrahman al Dawsi. Naam, naam. We only talked about this earlier. I mentioned him in one of the previous hadith. So I, I think I forgot to mention his kunya here. Barakallah. Right. So the next question, sorry, the next uh, chapter, chapter 16, uh, the Sheikh titles it that the angels, the malaika, also fear and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They also fear and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the title of this chapter. The first ayat which the Shaykh brings in this chapter. 
this word shafa you will come across it in the next chapter as well a lot in the hu illa liman adina lahu hatta idha fuzia an qulubihim qalu ma ga qala rabbukum qalu al haqq wa huwa al aliyul qabir intercession with him prophets not except for whom he permits hear him and he is referring to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until when when fear is banished from their hearts whose hearts the angels they the malaika the angels they say what is it that your lord has said they say the truth and he is the highest the greatest uh, surah saba ayat 23 naam so allah subhanahu sorry the, the sheikh here now is introducing ash shifa the concept of shifa we will see this in, the, in, in detail in the next chapter and but the focus of this chapter is the angels because once this uh, this was was uh, the ayat was revealed it talks about the angels feared allah i mean the fear was taken away from their hearts they asked what did your 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 rab or allah what did allah reveal and then it was said to them the truth al haq qalu al haq wa huwa al aliyul qabir and he is the highest he is the greatest subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about intercession you know the concept itself is that so if i want something done let's say in a government office okay um i don't know get my sale deed registered or whatever right and uh, i know it's going to take a while it's going to take time paperwork blah 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 files moving from one place to another so i come to know someone my cousin knows this guy in the government department so i go to the cousin and tell him can you help me with this can you get this done for me this intercession right the 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 the, the, the uh, language meaning if you want to call it the intercession we are talking about is something different totally but just to know understand the meaning of intercession a shifa is this person my cousin now he goes to this government officer and he gets my file through so he has interceded for me with this government officer clear now coming to a shifa and that no one can intercede for another unless allah permits this is referring to a uh, intercession on the day of judgment not in earthly matters clear except which allah permits it it is a confirmation of allah's greatness and divine attribute of speech because allah the ayat says in surah saba uh, qalu al haq allah said allah spoke al haq the truth that's a speech and the end of the ayat says uh, ali ul kabir the greatest and the highest and all of creation would be fearful and terrified of allah even the angels fear allah and are humbled in his presence in fact they flap their wings and on another another hadith when they heard this they would flatter or flap their wings uh, uh, very feverishly which creates causes a noise because they're scared and they tremble in front of allah's presence but you and i or i and you rather huh that's a that's a question we need to ask ourselves do we fear allah when we when we recite the quran when we read ayat of the quran when a hadith is mentioned to us that allah said this or rasulullah said this do we fear allah we talk we're talking about yawm al qiyamah we're talking about the day of judgment we talked about how the sun and the moon will be thrown into the hellfire imagine standing and seeing this events happening does this also call, i mean does, does this that does this even uh, generate fear in us that's the point So someone who's fearful of Allah inshallah will be careful will avoid the haram for example but today we as muslims have lost has law have lost subhanallah have lost the fear of Allah this is the problem the reason the sheikh brought this chapter here because the previous chapter we talked about creation not being an act of worship and we focused on rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and other prophets and so on in this chapter someone who's fearing allah in this case the angels al malaika when they fear allah how can you worship them how can you worship them how can you worship someone who themselves fear allah so why don't you directly worship allah that's the point the sheikh is trying to make with this ayat of surah saba the false deities are nowhere comparable to the angels so when the angels themselves cannot be worshiped because they themselves fear allah as one of their attributes how can you worship pieces of stone 
and men and women and so on and so forth. The angels are people who are, or the creation which is, cannot make any mistake, right? Angels, the difference between the creation or, 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 the, or, the, or, the, or, or angels and humans, for example, or the angels and jinn, for example, is that angels cannot do wrong. They do not disobey Allah subhanahu It's not how they are created. They only obey Allah, that's it. But the humans and the jinn, Allah gave us the faculties to differentiate and, and to, to, to understand and to use our brains either to follow Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or to disobey them. The speech of Allah are free from falseness. That's another thing from the uh, hadith, or sorry, the ayat which we learn. We talked about this as well earlier. We talked about this. I'm going to skip this. Terror is removed from their hearts or the fear is removed from their hearts. It means that when the angels are released from the fear that strikes them on hearing the words of Allah. The very speech of Allah puts them in a terrified mood. They're scared. They're scared. And they ask, what has your upset? So it is a validation, confirmation that the words of Allah are not created. Remember, remember we talked about this earlier. The speech of Allah, the Quran, is uncreated. Uncreated. Speech of Allah. This again is proof of that. Because they have said, what did Allah say? Nah? They didn't say, what did Allah create in terms of speech? They said, what did Allah say? The first hadith which the Sheikh brings is a long hadith. Uh, it's, it's kind of related to this, but let me read through it. Sahih Bukhari, just bear with me. Abu Huraira radiallahu an said that the Prophet said, when Allah decrees some order in the heaven, when he passes an uh, order, which is already, bear in mind, recorded in Lohim Hafuz. The angels flutter their wings because the angels have wings, indicating complete surrender to his saying, with sounds like chains being dragged on rock. So if you want to compare the sound which the angels make when they hear the speech of Allah, when they flutter their wings, it's as though somebody is dragging chains, uh, metal or iron chains over rocks, that kind of sound. And they say the truth. Sorry, they say, what has your Rabb said? When the fear has been banished, they say the truth. The Allah is the most high, the most great, or the greatest. Then, the stealthy listeners, the hadith talks about the shayateen, the, the, the bad jinn. Yeah? The stealthy listeners hear this order. And these stealthy listeners are like this. Rasulullah said, like this. And he kind of demonstrated to Sufyan, and Sufyan, the narrator, also demonstrated to the others. One over the other. So they go one over the other. These shayateen, they go one over the other to try to listen to what is being said. A stealthy listener, the shayateen, <coughs> the shaitan, hears a word which he will convey to that which is below him. So he passes on that word. The second shaitan, shaitan will pass it on to one below him. Till the last one will convey it to the Magician, the fortune teller, the wizard, what have you. Sometimes a flame of fire may strike the devil before he can convey it. And sometimes he may convey it before this flame strikes. You get the point? We will discuss this, of course, in inshallah in detail. Whereupon the wizard or the magician adds to that word which he got from this shayateen, a hundred lies. The people will then say, didn't he, the shaitan, uh, tell such and such thing on such and such date? So that magician is said to have told the truth because of the statement which has been heard from the heavens. Sahih al-Bukhari. So a lot of things in this hadith, and we'll try to break it down, inshallah. Sufyan ibn Onayna ibn Maimun al-Hilali heard it from Abu Huraira. So he's the sub-narrator. Abu Huraira, we already discussed him in many hadith earlier as well. He was a trustworthy imam and scholar, Sufyan who also demonstrated the, 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 the way the shayatin stand on one, one on top of the other, try to reach, reaching, reach, try to reach in the heavens. Yeah? And he died uh, in 198 Hijriya, which means he was a tabi. Allah Azza wa Jal, when he decrees a matter in the heavens, the angels fall in sajda, in fear of him, and in glorification of him. Jibreel Alayhi the scholar, was most probably the one who replied 
to this question of the angels. Because the angels asked, what has your Rabb said? And the reply was, the truth. So the scholars say, most likely it was Jibreel Islam who replied to the angels because he is the head or the leader of the angels. It is also confirmation of where is Allah. This is another problem, brothers and sisters, we have today in the Ummah. Many people feel and believe firmly that Allah is everywhere. He's everywhere. So he is in the sofa set, he's in the bike, he's in the cupboard, he's in me, he's in you. SubhanAllah. This is wrong. There's a serious aqidah issue. Allah and the hadith of Rasulullah comes to mind. One of his sahabi, he had a slave girl. And one day the slave girl, she took some sheep out and she made some mistake or something. Allahu alam. And when she came home and when, when, the, when the master of the sahabi came to know this mistake, he slapped her on the face. He slapped her on the face. And then he realized it was a mistake because slapping on the face is, is not allowed in Islam. Striking the face. So he went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said, Ya Rasulullah, I did this. So, what do you advise me? He said, call the slave girl. The slave girl came. Rasulullah asked her, who am I? Slave girl, Yashik. Slave girl. She was not a PhD uh, uh, in Sharia, having a doctoral degree. No, a slave girl. Rasulullah sallam, asked her, who am I? She said, you're Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he asked her, Aina Allah, where is Allah? She pointed her forefinger upwards. She took her hand, her forefinger, the first finger, yeah, index finger as you call it, and she pointed it upwards. And she said, Fissama, above the heavens. Rasulullah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She is, 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 uh, is a mumina. She's a believer with funny man. Release her. Set her free. That's your kafara. Set her free. But the one I want to make here is that she pointed it upwards. She didn't tell Rasulullah Allah is there or here, left and right. No, I'll believe. And we have many other ahadith, many other ayat to prove this. But this hadith comes to mind. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on his arsh, his throne, in a manner which suits his majesty the best, above the seven heavens. Above that. But by his knowledge, he knows everything. He's everywhere by his knowledge. And he descends, as we know. Yom al-Arafah, he descends. In the last third of the night, he descends. Barak Lafiq. The hadith also talks about the heavens, matters being decreed in the heavens. And we know from Rasulullah Sallallahu uh, hadith that there are seven heavens which Allah has created. So when I, may, when I say heavens in my lectures, brothers and sisters, I don't mean Jannah. I don't mean paradise. So for Jannah, I, I use the word paradise. And for the Samawat, I use heavens. Now, uh, so sometimes people of knowledge they, they use heavens for paradise so I just want to clarify that Time. so the seven heavens Allah has created one above the other one above the other and all that we see of this dunya and all that you see of the stars and the galaxies and the I don't know Milky Way or Milky Way or whatever yeah everything that we see of all the stars and everything is part of the lowest heaven. Lowest heaven. I'm just trying to give you a lesson in Tawheed in terms of Al Khalik, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith Rasulullah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in a different hadith, the size of the lowest heaven to the heaven above that. So these are all one above the other. The size of the lowest heaven to the heaven above that is like a ring in the desert. Allah. So you go to the desert, I don't know, Arabian desert, Sahara desert, whatever desert. Huge expanse of sand, as long as I can see. You take a finger ring, you're wearing a ring, and throw it in the sand. The size of the ring, compared to the size of the desert, is the lowest heaven in size compared to the heaven above it. And then Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, likewise, the size of the sixth heaven to the fifth heaven above it is like a ring in the desert. And so on and so forth. Until he reached the kursi, the footstool of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And he said the size of the top heaven, the topmost heaven, to the footstool, Al Kursi, is like a ring in the desert. So, can you imagine? I mean, this itself is mind blowing. We cannot even uh, phantom it or imagine it or put this in, in, in perspective. Our brains cannot comprehend this kind of size. So what about the one who created this? So confirmation again in this hadith about Allah's divine attribute of speech. Confirmation that shayateen from the jinn over here what the angels are saying in the heavens. And Allah has allowed this as a trial for them. So what happens in this? There's another hadith regarding this about the flame of fire pursuing them and so on. So the, the shayateen basically, right? They try to go up to the lowest heaven and try to listen to what the angels are discussing about Al-Qadr, what is going to happen on the earth. Because Allah has decreed this and informed them in the heavens, right? So they go to try to snatch this. Sometimes, and they stand one out of the other. Sometimes before they're able to snatch it, the angels, they see the shayateen and they, they, they kind of drive them away using flames of fire. Sometimes they, they are able to catch something from the heavens, the shayateen, and they bring it down to the magicians. And this is what you see as shooting stars. Sometimes in the night when you look up, you see a shooting star, right? You see what you call a shooting star. You see a, a blaze of light. This is actually an angel hurling a flame of fire to drive away the shayateen. We're trying to hear, overhear what is being discussed among the angels in the heavens. Shooting stars is this. Science may give you some other gibberish. But in Islam, this is what Islam Allah, Allah tells us. that These are the shooting stars. And these shayatin, they bring this information and they have agreements with the jinn and the fortune tellers and the magicians and the wizards and the Harry Potters of the day and the Linda Goodsman of the day. Huh? And they share this with them. So, and these magicians, they use this one, one huck and one true word, and they mix with it hundred lies. And then they inform this to the, their followers and they try to amaze their followers. Who knows what is the ruling on, on mag magic and magicians? What is the ruling in Islam? What is the ruling on Islam? In Islam, sorry, on, on magic and the magician. Brother Khadr, let me give someone else a chance. I come back to you, inshallah. Killing them. Killing them is the had, the punishment. Well, what is the ruling? What is the hukum? Nullifies of Islam. Okay, take shot of Islam. Alhamdulillah. Again, when we say, brothers and sisters, when we say, kufur, okay. When we say ruling in Islam, right? It's one of five. It's one of five. Always remember this. Ahkam al-Islam is one of five. Fard, Mustahab, Mubah, Makru, Haram. Aywa, Haram. Nah. That's what that was, that was the answer I was looking for. But all of your other answers are right in, in different uh, contexts, yes. But magic is Haram. The magician, what he's doing is Haram. Right? And this is Kufur. Nah. This is this is rejection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and it's, only, it's an alifad of Islam. Nah. Yes, it is one of the namakad of Islam, one of the ten nullifiers of Islam is uh, practicing magic. It takes you out of the fold of Islam. And the had, yes, is killing them. Ma'am, you're right. The punishment for the magician, if he doesn't repent, is to chop his head off. And yes, the one who visits them without believing in it, the one who visits them believing in it, this is haram for him. He left Islam. The one who visits them but doesn't believe in it, just for the heck of it, just out of curiosity, such a person his salah is not acceptable for 40 days. Now, if you believe in them, you're out of Islam. Now, now, this is our Barakallah. So this is magician. This is, this is magic. Taib. And it's a very serious thing, as we know from the ayat of Sulaiman al-Islam in Surah Baqarah and, and, and other uh, things. This is a very serious issue. Okay. How am I doing time? Okay. Um, maybe we'll just stop after the slide. Evidence that magicians and soothsayers are liars and cheats. So do not trust them, do not believe them. 
They may say something which comes true, yes, but they got this from the shayateen. It doesn't mean they're right. It does not, does not mean they know ilm al-ghayb. Paraklafi. Um, and the people and the human by human nature, you, you, you grab what has actually happened, but the other 99 things or the 100 things which he said, which did not happen, you kind of ignore. Because when you go to a palmist or a, a fortune teller or the, the, the parrot picking up the bird, whatever, yani, a magician or a fortune teller, you know, these kind of soothsayers, he will give a long list, a list of things, you know, this will happen tomorrow, this will happen to you. Even the star signs, Leo, Sagittarius, uh, what else you have, I don't know. All these stars said, these are haram. Haram. Even if you just open the newspaper and just read it, not believe, you don't believe in it. You don't believe in it. You know Allah controls your future. But you just, okay, let's just see what, what Leo says today. A Sagittarius says today. If you even do that and read it, your salah is not acceptable for 40 days. You still have to pray, but it's not acceptable to Allah. It's a very serious issue. And this can lead to the major kufr. That's the problem. So all these things, yani, do not do not go near them. Harry Potter, same problem. But that's something contemporary, right? That the books and the movies, haram, completely haram. Yeah, Ustad, I'm just watching it. It's just, you know, fantasy and some people flying around here and there. If you just do that and watch it and your kids watch it, then your salah is not acceptable for 40 days. Now. And the state of the jinn standing on top of the other, Allah is omniscient, is present everywhere by his knowledge. Uh, okay, I think we'll stop with this because there could be some questions. So we are still in chapter, um, what is it, 16. We're talking about how the angels fear Allah and how it is foolish to worship the angels because they themselves fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, uh, next week. Okay, next week, maybe I cannot do a class. I'm not sure as yet because I may have to travel. Uh, it depends. I will let you know on the group. But most likely, I cannot do the class. But the following week, inshallah, I aim, if Allah is is is, uh, uh, is merciful and nice with me, inshallah, I aim to start also uh, the Rukia workshop and we'll continue with um, session 23. Uh, next week, I'm not so sure. Mostly, I may not be able to do it. But I will I will let you know, inshallah. Uh, but please, again, reminder of the test. Those who want to appear for the test, test number two. Uh, the link was sent to the groups. Please answer the test. Because I think it, it, it closes on Yom al uh, I suppose, uh, in the night, I think, or in the morning. I'm not sure. You need to check the group. Taib. Okay, let me see. You have this a question. Uh, Aslam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Does this happen only on Laylatul Qadr or on and off? Laylatul Qadr or on and off? I'm not sure. Are you referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming down? Uh, to the lowest heaven because this happens every night the last hour of the night i'm not sure what this is referring to if you can just post it again this is like uh, but I, I forgot I, I, I mentioned so many things i forgot what this is referring to Allah but just, just post it again please so i can uh, clarify that okay nullifiers of islam we talked about this uh, is it allowed okay the discourse with the angels no, 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 no. This, this happens anytime, anytime. Okay, what happens in Laila Al-Qadr, Laila Al-Qadr, is what is going to happen to the next year. So, from Laila Al-Qadr of 1444 to Laila Al-Qadr of 1445, all the events which are going to happen, yeah, are, are informed to the angels. Now, but this hadith is not referring only to this. Yes, this, it is also part of the hadith. Because this is information being given to the angels. But there are other things which happen in the heavens, which Allah, not, not necessarily with, with, with the inhabitants of the earth, but it also could be with the inhabitants of the angels, the scholars say. So all this is covered in the hadith. This information is given to the angels. It could be um, in, in terms of what you mentioned, Lail al-Qadr, it could be uh, who is going to die when, uh, whose risk is coming from where, when and how. So all this information is informed to the angels. But also during the other parts of the year, there are other things happening in the heavens which are also informed to the angels. Uh, so, uh, so I think it, it refers to uh, both, inshallah. Is it allowed to watch the magic show for kids? Okay. Yeah, this is a good topic. I should have discussed it actually. So when you say magicians are, are kuffar, generally speaking, not a particular person, and what they do as magic is, is kufr, ma'am. 
this is referring to the, the, the actual magic, which, which Allah says in the Quran is so strong and so powerful it can, it can separate a man from his wife. But what about things like, uh, let's say I have, I don't know, a, a pigeon hidden in my hat and I pull it out from the hat. Or I have a, a five dirham coin or a 10 real note, whatever, hidden up my sleeve and I take it out. And the kids are happy. Now, this is a trick. This is a trick. So we need to differentiate between magic and tricks. Okay. But now, bear in mind, there's all, there are also certain uh, tricks which deceive the eye. Hypnosis. That is, again, kufr. But I am talking about your, you know, um, small tricks, which, uh, you know, you can buy in a supermarket store, but they label it magic. The magician's kit, they call it, or something. It's not actually, actually magic. It's just a bunch of tricks with cards, with, with coins, with uh, a pigeon. Huh? This is not magic. But the scholars say you still avoid this. Because as with everything which is minor, it will always eventually lead to the major. So if, if you say it's perfectly okay, you can watch tricks and I can do tricks. Yes, technically speaking, it's okay. But this person, once he gets the fan following, once he gets the huge fan base, once he sees people are lo loving him, liking him, huh? now the shayatin come to him and they tell him, okay, why don't you, you know, contract with us and now we can make you disappear. We can make a train disappear. We can make the Taj Mahal disappear. We can make the Eiffel Tower disappear. Now that is magic. So eventually these people go down that path, even historically and statistically speaking. So it's best to avoid you can, there are different other entertainments your children can get, and I'm sure they'll be happy with this. And if you avoid these tricks, it is much better. Wallahu ala. I hope this is clear, inshallah. Barakallah. Jazakumullah khair for the question. But other magic is serious, you know, with, 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 with the jinn. And we're going to do Rukia workshops shortly, so we'll discuss that as well. How the jinni are sent to split the man from the wife, uh, create magic, and, and, and even, uh, even to the extent of uh, preventing pregnancy, even to the extent of uh, having issues in the heart, in your heart, in the, with the valves, they play with the valves. Wallahi. Inshallah, we'll discuss inshallah all of this. All by the will of Allah, of course, as, as, as a trial, as a test for the Muslims. Barakallah. I don't see any other questions. Okay, if you don't have any more questions, inshallah, we will wind up for the day. Zakmullah Khairan for attending. And again, reminder on the test. You just have two or three days left for the test. Please finish it. And next week, maybe I cannot do the class. Maybe I will let you know. But the following week, inshallah, inshallah, if Allah will, bismillah, we will definitely continue session 23. And inshallah, hopefully also start with the Rukia workshop or Niyam Sabt. Barakla fikum, jazakumullah khairan. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullah tubi ilaik. Wa akhirat dawana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam.